under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yep. Clerk, if you'll please call the roll. Mr. Burnett. Present. Mr. Goldstein. Present. Ms. Johnson. Present. Ms. Najilski Eichner. Present. Ms. Smith. Here. Ms. Ayers. Present. Mr. Uvelman. Present. Ms. Revoluz. Here. Ms. Young. Here. Mr. Kites. Here. Ms. McMurr. Present. Ms. Alterman. Here. Mr. Keegan. Here. Mr. Livingston. Here. Ms. Shannon. Here. 15, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the acceptance of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 8th, 2022. Do I have a motion? Ms. Shanahan moves. Are there any uh, corrections, deletions, omissions, or additions? I don't see anybody. Okay, so all in favor of approving the minutes as submitted. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries, thank you. Next item on the agenda is public participation. Do we have anybody wishing to address the council? I see one hand raised and Diane Loricella. Would you like me to bring her in? Ms. LaRochella? Ms. LaRochella, can you hear us? Yes, and yes, hello. Good evening, Mayor, good evening, Common Council and staff. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing my face to be seen, although I wasn't expecting it, so I have, I'm having a bad hair day. But anyway, um, Tonight, I just wanted to speak about uh, one topic that came up suddenly. Um, it has to do with the uh, finance and claims item related to the uh, firehouse uh, that you'll be voting on tonight. Um, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of uh, the money being um, taken from the ARPA monies with the proviso that um, land use and building management and the new ad hoc sustainability committee take a look and see where we can make sure. I mean, it's over slightly over a quarter million dollars, and I and I've read the uh, the articles. Um, I believe that unless and until uh, we don't want to throw good money after after bad, and. Um, with today's modern green infrastructure and green building design, I believe that this, I ask that you consider adding a friendly amendment that relates to adding, instead of just fixing old fashioned traditional HVAC systems, this site is, is just ripe for solar panels, both ground mounted and roof mounted with repairs, uh, some new, new additions to the building, um, Unless this has already been designed as a net zero energy building, a standalone building, I believe that we should press the pause button. Um, I know that there are serious problems with this building, but, but they've been there for a while. Not to say that our firefighters do not deserve a safe and healthy environment, they do. Um, Jack Yost, former fire chief Jack Yost would be flipping in his grave in the 1990s, he made me chair of the local emergency planning committee. And one thing he and I spoke about was the redesign of some of these standalone fire buildings to make them more efficient. Back in the 90s, he talked about the potential for clean energy on whatever buildings possible. And we know what happened with the new headquarters. We just never could quite get solar panels on that new beautiful building. So let's not continue this the time has come for our city whenever there's any kind of 
major construction, we have to include looking at net zero energy design and others are doing it. It's not a big stretch. I think our city is ready for it. Let's make sure the HVAC systems that we've been told are needed to be replaced. Let's look at heat pumps. Let's uh, air, air source heat pumps. Let's look at solar. And unless you're willing to do that council and mayor, I think that you should put this on hold, but I'm hoping that you can just add a friendly amendment that states that this city will look at any and all green building design to incorporate into this important firehouse need. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. LaRochella. Is there anybody else that is uh, indicating they wish to speak? Does any council person have correspondence that they feel needs to be read into the record this evening? Ms. Dixon, did you receive any correspondence? That None, you Mayor. No, okay. So we will close public session, public participation. Next item on the agenda, we have no resignations, no appointments, but we do have um, three reappointments. Uh, Donald Overton to the Board of Assessment Appeals, Steve Scottamaccia to the Board of Assessment Appeals, and Janet Woodward to the Board of Assessment Appeals. We can probably move all those together. Do I have a motion? Mr. Keegan moves. Uh, any further discussion or comment? Mr. Keegan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I would like to move uh, all three forward and... Uh, they're all real estate professionals. Um, and more importantly, I'd like to thank them for being willing to serve the citizens of the city of Noah on behalf of the council. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? Seeing none, all in favor of the appointments as moved? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Mayor's remarks. I just have a couple of brief remarks tonight. Um, as you know, tonight we have members of the Board of Education uh, joining us along with the Common Council. Um, we are going to be having a presentation on the um, Evergreen Solutions uh, Efficiency Study that was performed over the past uh, several months. Uh, quite some time ago, I proposed along with, uh, uh, I met with Dr. Adamowski um, and asked that we consider doing an efficiency study on both the uh, Norwalk Public Schools or Board of Education and the city of Norwalk operations to see where we might be able to uh, find some efficiencies. We might be able to consolidate some different uh, positions. Uh, we may be, uh, have some redundancies that we can eliminate. And tonight we're going to be having a presentation on the results of that uh, efficiency study. Uh, we have Miss Betty Russell here from Evergreen Solutions. Now, as we know, uh, as organizations move forward, uh, it's always good to take a look at your operation and see what you're doing well, but more importantly, to see what you can do better. We know that no organization is perfect. There's always room for improvement. And while we know we do a lot of things well, we always want to know, are there some things that we may be able to improve upon and how, we can, how can we make the operations of the city or the Board of Education or public schools um, more effective, more efficient in delivering our services to the taxpayers who uh, pay for these uh, services and expect these services. Now, there's going to be some recommendations that you'll see tonight. Uh, some of those recommendations um, can be implemented probably rather soon, rather uh, immediately. Others might take a little longer and others yet perhaps uh, longer or perhaps uh, not going to be uh, moved forward for uh, implementation. And this is not in any way, shape or form a criticism of any department, any individual. It's that we have been doing things a certain way for many, many years. And it's always good to bring in outside eyes, people with different experience, different expertise, to look at us with a, an eye a view towards improving or giving us opportunities to improve or making reckon, uh, recommendations how we can improve. 
And this is done in private sector all the time. Efficiency audits are common. And it, it's really, really important as we do our daily uh, jobs, as we move forward, it's really, really important that we do everything we can to make our operation more efficient, more effective, and so forth. So as I said, tonight we're gonna to be having a presentation, uh, 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 an executive uh, summary, if you will, and a, an explanation of the methodology that was used uh, in the uh, uh, efficiency study or the efficiency audit. Uh, I will say that based on my reading of the initial report, uh, Evergreen Solutions did a very deep dive and interviewed many of our employees to get some feedback and then to offer their recommendations. And again, I want to reiterate very, very strongly, this is not a criticism. There's no condemnation. Uh, everybody in the city is working hard, doing the best they can to provide the services, but there's always an opportunity to look at how we're doing and see if we can approve improve. So that is what I want to say, and I'm looking forward to having uh, the presentation from uh, Evergreen Solutions. And with that, I will turn over the uh, floor to the Council President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I too look forward to the presentation and discussion and welcome the members of the Board of Education to this meeting. I think it's great that we're all here together to get, get the same information at the same time. But before we get to that, I want, uh, we need to do some um, housekeeping as well as to go through our consent calendar and agenda. So we'll try and move it along quickly and appreciate everyone's patience. The first item is the reappointment of Kara A.T. Murphy to the Board of Ethics as a regular member. Do I have a motion? Uh, Ms. Nadilski Eichner. Um, so I'm very pleased to um, uh, move forward the renomination of Cara Murphy for the Board of Ethics. I had the pleasure of serving with her on the Board of Ethics for more than three years, and I can attest to her, her incredible attention to detail, her ability to analyze the um, code of ethics uh, in a way that actually is realistic and based on the actual implementation um, and workings of city government. So she was a real pleasure to work with. I'm so thrilled that she is willing to continue serving this walk, and I'm very grateful for her service. Thank you. Uh, any further commentary? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? Okay, it passes unanimously. I guess, Ms. Murphy, you here? I can't see all these. Things. Oh, congratulations. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to serve again. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, now move the consent calendar to be read tonight by Ms. Johnson. Thank you, President Livingston. Uh, here is the consent calendar for March 22nd. And uh, we begin with seven common council committees, A, Recreation, Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee. One, A1, approve the use of Calf Pasture Beach and immediate surrounding grounds by the Lightfoot Running Club for their Norwalk Mother's Day 10K race to be held on Sunday, May 8, 2022 from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Set up to begin at 7 a.m. with teardown at 11 a.m. Approximate 100 people. Uh, 7A3, approve the use of Cap Pastor Beach and the immediate surrounding grounds by the Coachman Rod and Custom Car Club for their Cruising at the Beach Car Show event to be held on the following Tuesdays, May 17, June 21, July 12, and August 16, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., set up to begin same Tuesdays at 4 p.m. with teardown at, at 9 p.m. with a rain date as follows, Friday, May 20, June 24, July 15, and August 19, 2022, approximate 250 people each Tuesday, parentheses or Friday in case of need to use a rain date, close parentheses. Uh, 7A4, approve the use of Matthews Park and immediate surrounding grounds by the Lockwood Matthews Mansion Museum for their scavenger hunt to be held on Sunday, June 5, 2022, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m set up to begin at 11 with teardown uh, at 5 p.m. I believe that should be 11 a.m. with teardown at 5 p.m., approximate 200 people. 
uh, 7A5, uh, approve the use of Cat Pasture Beach and immediate surrounding grounds by Mountain Workshop for their team building day to be held on June 13, Monday, June 13, and Wednesday, September 28, 2022, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Set up to begin at 7 a.m. with tear down at 3 p.m. each day, approximate 200 people. 7A6, approve the use of showmobile at Calf Pasture Beach and immediate surrounding grounds by 3rd Taxing District Electric Department for their Sunday's district concerts to be held on Sundays, July 10, 17, 24, and 31, August 14, 21, and 28, 2022, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Set up to begin at 1 p.m. with teardown at 9 p.m. every Sunday. Approximate 250 to 300 people. Uh, let's see, 7C, Finance and Claims Committee. Uh, 7C1, accept and approve the report of the Claims Committee dated March 10, 2022. 7C2, for informational purposes only, narrative on tax collections dated March 10, 2022. 7C3, for informational purposes only, monthly tax collector's report dated February 2022. And 7C4, resolution, requesting special emergency funding from the ARPA fund in the amount of $301,066 for the fire department to carry out emergency repairs at fire station number one at 90 New Canaan Avenue. General ledger account, American Rescue Plan Act, parentheses ARPA, fund 13. That concludes the consent calendar for this evening. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Unless there are any objections, I'll now call for a vote on the consent calendar as read. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, passage unanimously. Okay, back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Livingston. Uh, first item that we will discuss, uh, Ms. Young, is item 7A2. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just that we are doing this correctly, are we supposed to make a motion to suspend the rules to add new language? Correct. Okay. So I make that motion to suspend the rules. Uh, Ms. Young has made a motion to suspend the rules so we can add the appropriate language for item 7A2. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, we have a super majority on that. So Ms. Young? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So 7A1, Recreation and Parks and Culture Affairs Committee. A2A, approve the use of Veterans Park and immediate surround ground by Frank C. Godfrey, American Legion Post 12 for their Wall That Heals event to be held on May 31st till Sunday, June 5th, 2022 from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Set up on Tuesday, May 31st, 2022 at 8 a.m. with teardown on Monday, June 6, 2022 at 6 p.m. Approximate attendance, 15,000 people. And I'd like to move both uh, and to be. Authorize Harry W. Rilling to execute a license agreement with Frank C. Godfrey American Legion Post 12 for their the Wall That Heals event to be held on May 31st till Sunday, June 5th, 2022 from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Set up on Tuesday, May 31st, 22, 2022 at 8 a.m. with teardown on Monday, June 6, 2022 at 6 p.m. Licensing agreement to include standard terms plus payment by city to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund for the provision of the Wall That Heals Mobile Education Center and support staff for the event in an amount not to exceed $10,000. Count numbers noted. Thank you, Ms. Young. So uh, have to, I guess, uh, vote number uh, first to the new language. Uh, so all in favor of the new language as proposed by Ms. Young. Motion, uh, all uh, opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Now we will vote on uh, item 7A, 2A, and 2B. Um, uh, so, sorry. Mayor, do we, do we want to have uh, the folks that are here, Mr. DeWitt? Um, if, sure. Uh, if you want to have him explain a little bit, that's great. Yes, Thank I, you. I, I'd like that. Okay. 
Mr. Be honored and, and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Mayor, uh, members of the Common Council, Board of Ed that are on, because this is a big piece of this. Uh, back in 2000, the city of Norwalk hosted the Wall at Heels, which is a replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, Nancy Sinatra herself uh, showed up to that event in 2000. The city of Norwalk applied in 2019 to bring this event back to Norwalk in 2020. That was canceled due to COVID reasons. Uh, I'm making a long story long, I guess, but uh, uh, the history is important. Um, so we applied again in, in 2021 to bring the wall back to Norwalk in 2022. We were the first city in the country to apply for this year's tour. We have been approved for the national tour of the Wall at Heels uh, to come to Norwalk the first weekend in June. Um, this is, a, like I said, a, a replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in DC. It's a three quarter scale replica, so not, not the exact same size. But I think uh, Vietnam veterans um, were not treated well when they got back to the United States. They're aging. This is a way for the city to uh, recognize their service in a proud way. Um, I, I've said in a number of circles that this is a county-wide event and Norwalk's just the host city. And I think uh, there's enough traction here to make this a successful event. And what we wanna do is shine a bright light on the city of Norwalk. And if people come to see this event in Veterans Park to stay, go to Cat Pasture, go to the Maritime Aquarium, Washington Street, those sorts of things. Um, I mentioned the Board of Ed being on the call. This is a, um, when this was scheduled for 2020, it was in August when school was out of session. And when we reapplied, I asked to make it a priority to make Norwalk part of the uh, tour during the school year. and. We got what we asked for, and uh, I'm working with Joe Gianderco, who's a, a teacher at Punks Ridge Middle School, to do uh, some school visits to the wall at Vets Park on uh, Thursday and Friday, June 2nd and 3rd, to educate the children of Norwalk and the surrounding area about what the Vietnam War was and kind of connect the warrior to the war. Um, I'm not sure that's happening a lot in schools, and that's not a political statement. It's, it's just a matter of prioritization of uh, uh, curriculum and that sort of thing, and I get that. But this is an opportunity right in our own backyard to do this, and uh, um, we have a great plan going forward, a solid committee going forward. I've forwarded the mayor uh, <coughs> for meetings and that sort of thing, and uh, uh, thank you for your time. That's it. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, Ms. Young? I think, thank you, Mr. DeWitt. We appreciate your effort in making this happen in the city of Norwalk. Um, so I think um, next thing is to vote. Uh, uh, Mr. Keegan, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Keegan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Young. First, I, I think we should all thank Jeff DeWitt and the American Legion for bringing the Wall of Deals to our city. Uh, it's gonna be a, a fine event. When I first saw this initiative on our agenda, uh, I contacted Chairwoman Young and Ken Hughes to see if there was some way that we could maybe pay the fees uh, to honor the heroes whose names appear on that wall. And to all of our veterans, especially the, uh, the veterans of the Vietnam era. And I, I was very proud to learn that um, the fees will be paid by the city. Um, and um, my statement is simply, uh, there may be some questions as to where this money will be drawn from, but I propose that the price that we, the city will be paying for them is nothing when compared to the price that they paid for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keegan. Uh, any further comments or discussion? Well, I'd like that. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to thank Mr. DeWitt 
very much for uh, for your efforts to bring the wall that heals to Norwalk and uh, say what an honor it is for our city to host the wall. And um, I would just like to thank my good friend and former colleague, Joe Giandurko, for um, his efforts to work with you. Uh, you know, Joe's a great teacher, uh, really committed to his students. And I'm really pleased that our, our students are going to be able to visit the wall. So thank you. I, I'm in so much support of this. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any further comments? Mr. Kites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll echo the comments of my colleagues here in regards to Mr. DeWitt. Um, and all the work you do for the Veterans Affairs Commission. Uh, great, this is great to see this happening. Great for the effort. This is, um, you know, long uh, overdue. And, but to that point, I'd like to mention also that this expense was unforeseen in the capital, or excuse me, the operating uh, budget of uh, Recreation and Parks. And I know we got Robert here on the line. Robert, at some point, if, uh, you know, seeing that this is an unforeseen expense and you feel like that you're lacking in some way uh, with your already very lean budget, I hope that you come back uh, to the mayor's office and to this council. And because uh, I know there's been some talk uh, that uh, if there were the case, they needed additional funding that, you know, we would definitely be open to the idea of having that happen through several different means. So, but thank you all and thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Kites. Uh, Mr. Stowers. Yeah, the mayor's already assured me of that. So <laughs> thank the mayor for that. He assured me of that today. I, I just wanted to, to compliment and, and thank American Legion uh, Post 12 as well for the, for the work they've done and for being so cooperative with me and Ken Hughes. We've met them down at the site. They've got a, a terrific plan. They've uh, uh, got a lot of cooperation from the tax, tax district on some of the services that they need there. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, they've got security, they, they're working on special events uh, permit, and so they're covering all the bases, and I, I think it's going to be a, a, a wonderful um, uh, event, and uh, we've, we've also let him know if he needs anything from us, he can he can count on us. Thank you, Mr. Thank Stowers. You. Any further comment? Uh, I, I want to thank Jeff DeWitt. He has been a wonderful addition to the city of Norwalk. He's a uh, chief master sergeant, I believe, out of the Air Force. Is it chief master sergeant? And uh, when I asked him to take on the veterans, I'm sorry, the military uh, and veterans liaison committee position, he willingly stepped forward and he's doing a remarkable job providing uh, guidance, providing support for all our military people, all our veterans. Uh, and I really, uh, I couldn't have asked, uh, I, I couldn't have found a better person to do this job. So, so thank you to Jeff. Um, also, thank you to Frank Godfrey, uh, American Legion Post 12, of which I am also a member for stepping up and agreeing to host this event. I was at the Wall That Heals in the year 2000. It's a remarkable uh, uh, a replica of the wall in, in Washington, D.C., but it's also very solemn. We have many young people from the city of Norwalk who served during the Vietnam War, people uh, who lost friends, and as Mr. DeWitt said, uh, returning home. It was not the warm reception that other military uh, uh, other military people uh, received when they got home. It was uh, rather difficult uh, and it was not something that uh, made people feel warm and fuzzy. So this is something that's critically important to help some of the healing. Uh, many people in Norwalk have lost friends in Vietnam. I lost friends in Vietnam. And it's a sad thing, uh, over 65,000 young men and women from the country uh, across the nation lost their lives in the Vietnam War. So this is really a great thing. And uh, if there's no further comment, then I will take a vote all in favor. Opposed. Abstentions. Motion carries unanimously. And thank you. And I would encourage everybody to take the time to go look at this uh, uh, display. Thank you. Next thank item you. on the agenda, it would be item seven. A7, I believe. Ms. Young? Yes. So, A7, A7, approve the use of Matthews Park and immediate surrounding grounds by Ted Thomas Dance Foundation for their 
Fairfield County Dance Festival to be held on Thursday, July 21st, 2022 from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Set up to begin at 8 a.m. with tear down no later than 8.30 p.m. with a rain date of Tuesday, July 26, 2022, approximate attendance, 200 people. So Ms. Young moves the item. Would you like to speak on it? Um, I think I saw Mr. Thomas. Yes, here I am. Yes. How are you, sir? If you'd like I'm to just give good. us a, a, a bit of a background, because this is a new, your first time doing yes, this Yes, this is my first time. I've been, I'm a Norwalk resident, and I've lived in Norwalk for the past 15 years. I'm a dance teacher here in um, the area, and I do a lot of outreach at the Carver Center. And I've been uh, I'm a dance teacher and owning a business in New Canaan for the last 25 years. Um, we have several dance companies in the area, in Norwalk and in New Canaan and just around and a lot of musicians and artists. And we would like to present a dance and music festival with local artists and local musicians and local dance companies, right? So there's a huge dance audience in Fairfield and Norwalk, especially with several different dance schools that um, have students that are looking to in, um, enhance their arts education, especially in the field of dance and music. So this year, what we would like to do is present several local dance companies, Thomas Ortiz Dance, um, East Coast Contemporary Ballet, um, a, music, a celloist, um, Melissa Westgate out of Westport, and um, present just an evening free to the public um, for people to come out and just um, spend an evening with the arts. And, you know, and then after it's going to be a portable stage that we have rented and we're going to um, bring it out in the morning, set it up and put a few chairs out there for people who don't have long chairs, but we're going to um, encourage people to bring long, long chairs, picnic, banquets, and you know, and just have a nice evening under the stars watching dance. So thank you. I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if Mr. Stowers had anything to add to that. Um, yeah, um, Justin, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful event. Um, um, of course, like I said, like I come from Seattle where we have dancing, uh, uh, things set up even in our downtown area. We have uh, something called dancing until dawn. So I, I, I don't think he's going to go until dawn, though, right, Thomas? But um, I think it's going to be a wonderful um, event, and uh, uh, we we endorse it. And um, uh, he's been um, working on special uh, permit uh, insurance, and so he's following all the the guidelines that he has to do, and. Uh, uh, we 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 think it's going to be okay. We think it's going to be a, a great event, and hope to see more like this. Ms. Young. Um, so I, I I don't know if anyone has any other questions about that, but thank you, Mr. Thomas, um, and we look forward to hopefully a wonderful event and many more to come. Yes, I'm looking forward to doing it. Um, try to make it an annual thing because I think this area really can use it and it can Absolutely. sustain it. Absolutely. And there's the, and the interest is here. People right. want to see the arts and want to see dance and want to hear lovely music and have a nice, relaxing evening. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further comment, then all in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. And the next item on the agenda is item 7B1. Ms. Shanahan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the motion that I wanna put on the floor is to approve the following revisions and amendments to the following city code sections. 98-43 blocking of intersections. And we have Garrett Boella here with us and Kyle Benjamin to describe the situation that we're asking to change. Mr. Boella. Yes, good evening, council members. So the transportation uh, TMP uh, has spent some time analyzing the intersection of East Avenue at, at Olmstead Place. And we went before the traffic authority in November with a proposal to implement uh, do not block the box pavement markings and signage at this intersection with Olmstead Place. And really the challenge is, is we received uh, some citizen inquiries and I have Kyle Benjamin, our traffic analyst, 
on this call as well, but just really looking at difficulties entering and exiting uh, Olmstead Place and also for residents of Knickerbocker uh, that use the intersection of East Avenue and Olmstead Place daily. But there's just challenges because the queue typically spills back from the intersection. Drivers enter the intersections and do not realize that they are blocking access to Olmstead Place. So we met with the community in uh, December of 2021 to explain to the residents um, what we propose would be the implementation of a do not block the box and, and related signage there. Um, so drivers can be better informed of the area where they can queue and where they have to stop short of the stop bar to leave the access and space available for residents. We met with the community um, as part of this proposal, there would be no change to access to the street. Residents would be able to um, maintain movements in and out, taking left and right turns into and out of the street. We also clarified um, that the way the ordinance is written, um, turning vehicles are exempt from uh, the violations and the fines. So a resident or someone looking to access the street uh, wouldn't be at risk of being fined as long as they were completing a turning maneuver. So we met with the residents of the street. We also canvassed the street um, up and down, knocking door to door, uh, talking to all the residents and, and, they were, and the results were, were generally positive. Um, so we are here before you for the implementation tonight of a do not block the box installation at Olmstead Place. At the same time, we looked at the ordinance and it provides a list of intersections and the intersection of East, or sorry, North Avenue and France Street and Park Street um, also was previously on the list of intersections for Do Not Block the Box. Um, it's no longer needed. It actually hasn't been reinstalled since the state uh, built and repaved the roadway. Uh, and this previous uh, Do Not Block the Box at this intersection was installed because the intersection to the east, uh, which is uh, East Avenue and North Avenue. Um, at the time, it wasn't improved. Um, There's a lot of spillback from the, the queues, which impacted France and North Avenue. But since then, the state has come in. They've installed a, a dedicated left turn lane um, and maintained two travel lanes through if you're going eastbound on North Avenue. So that do not the box, do not block the box is simply no longer needed. So we're looking to clean up the, the tax, um, remove it from that intersection but also provide some relief for residents on Olmstead Place and East Avenue. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Any questions for Mr. Bolella? Ms. McMurr? I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this is in my neighborhood right down the street from my home and I commend you for going door to door and really getting um, communication out there with all the neighbors to get their feedback on this. I think that's super important when you're doing something like this. And I think your team went above and beyond for that. And I really do appreciate that. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. And as, as we stress to the, the neighbors too, our, our work isn't done after we um, after tonight. So we will continue to reach out and provide some letters to the neighborhood before the actual implementation as part of our education, um, because it's, it's engineering and education. So we will continue that process. And then um, as we spoke with the residents, uh, we made a commitment to monitor the situation and um, come back to them with some results of the efficacy of the do not block the box. Don't Thank forget you. the third E enforcement. So we'll take care of that too. Yes. Uh, yes. Ms. Ms. Smith. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Garrett, there, I noticed there is a $100 fine that goes along with blocking the box and, and going to your point about education. What will the education process be and the signage around that area? Um, you know, how, how clearly will it be posted that there's a $100 fine? Yeah, so there will be new signage installed. And, and this is really going to be, so just to clarify, the Do Not Block the Box will be installed across the northbound approach only. Um, and it will only apply to vehicles traveling northbound on East Avenue. So it really is just to target those offenders that are, are backing up the queue. And then I just one clarification I want to point out, the way the Connecticut general statutes are written and the way our ordinance was adopted based on those statutes, it is uh, exempt. It, it does exemptify um, large vehicles, heavy vehicles. So they they are exempt so that there may be times where they block the intersection, but for passenger cars, uh, they will be subject to that fine, but it will be, it will be clearly marked. And uh, we've also made a commitment to uh, provide outreach, not just to the residents that I mentioned on Knickerbocker and Olmstead, but also through um, social media. Um, we've, we've been doing transportation Tuesdays. We look to provide some of that media and outreach as well, but it will be clearly noted uh, at the intersection as well. 
Um, and we will work with enforcement to provide a, a program that works um, for residents. So maybe there's an opportunity um, to provide some, some warning tickets uh, or citations first before um, we go full force with enforcement. Great. We do um, have a picture, Ms. Smith, if you would like to see it now. I just need a second to bring it up on screen, but if not, no worries. So. Uh, yeah, why don't you show the uh, council right. and uh, what it will look like. Thank you, Kyle. Yep, give me two seconds for some reason. It's not logged into my Adobe. Okay. Oh, never mind. It's giving me a fidget, but I can show it to you. It's just going to be sideways. I apologize about that. Um, can everyone see my screen? I yep. apologize that it's sideways. Um, so the signage as of right now will remain. Um, and then we will be painting the box as Garrett explained. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding to, um, so the subject to fine. So we're, it's as a requirement, um, and, and say in the ordinance, there will be a do not block the sign, but it will be clearly the hundred dollar fine will be clearly specified in the sub placard as well. Thank you. Apologies about not being able to rotate my screen as well. I tried to see it. <laughs> okay, so uh, any further comments or discussion? Um, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries, thank you. That brings thank us... You to uh, the presentation for this evening. Item 6A, uh, reports, report of Evergreen Solutions. And we have with us um, the Evergreen Solution team being led by Miss Betty Russell. And uh, we will turn the floor over to you, Miss Russell. I am Betty Russell. I was muted for a moment there. Uh, I am joined by Jeff Ling, who is the president of Evergreen Solutions, and we're going to share this presentation, and I'm going to let him begin. I assume that everyone has received their printed copy of the report um, and the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Betty. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Jeff Ling, and I, I would like to start us off this evening as, as we go through the presentation together. And Betty will be driving the presentation. So in a few moments, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint. Some opening comments that I would like to make. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both sides, on uh, the schools and the city side, for their participation in this process. Uh, applaud them and commend them for going through this process. Uh, in some ways, uh, this process is not a pleasant process uh, of having outsiders come in take a look at your operations, uh, provide feedback on efficiencies, uh, to in essence identify things that, that maybe might be on your list to deal with or to address as an organization, but you haven't gotten to yet. And so in many ways in going through this process, it takes some steely nerves and, and a real commitment. And so we wanna start off by thanking as well as applauding you for that. Uh, in many ways, as we go through an efficiency, uh, process or efficiency analysis process, as the mayor mentioned in some of his opening comments, really the purpose is not to identify issues or things that are problems, more to identify areas for improvement, areas for growth, opportunities for you to adjust your approach to doing business to better align with citizens' needs or practices that would maximize the resources that you have as an organization. Uh, as we go through the presentation this evening, uh, we'll talk about a variety of things. We'll, we'll talk about the approach that we utilize, We'll talk about the interaction that we had with your staff. We'll talk about some high level issues uh, that, that came up, uh, cross, cross cutting issues that really existed within both sides or both organizations. Uh, then Betty will talk about the city as well as the public schools, commendations and recommendations. There's a discussion as well on opportunities for collaboration or opportunities for you to work together in the future. Uh, there is some estimated costs as well as savings uh, that are identified in the recommendations. Uh, we summarize that at the end of the presentation. And we're asking that you hold your questions till the end. Uh, many times what we find is a rather lengthy presentation. You've probably seen it in, when you looked over the PowerPoint, 
We find that some questions are addressed as we go through the PowerPoint together. Uh, in addition, many times questions that tie together to other themes or, or other concepts, uh, those become more clear as we finalize the presentation. And so, again, we, we would ask that you hold questions till the end, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you might have when we reach that point. So if we take a look at the overview, what was Evergreen asked to do? So Evergreen was asked to come in in October of 2021 and to assist you with a review of the city's operations as well as the public school operations. Purpose was, as indicated in your RFP, was to ensure that all programs, operations, and the structure of the city and NPS are operating at maximum efficiency, creating the most good for all of its citizens. Again, as I mentioned, really our goal is in this process to identify those areas and which improvements might be made to maximize the resources that are available to you. More specifically, the study did not simply aim to identify immediate cost savings or short-term short gains. Uh, many times as consultants, we're asked to come in when a budget is short or when an organization doesn't have resources to continue to operate in the manner that it's operating. That was not your scope of work. You asked us to come in and look over the long term, operationally, what are some of those synergies? What are some of those opportunities for operational efficiencies? that we could recommend to you. In addition, we were asked to identify the appropriate means by which you could increase efficiency and effectiveness into the future. And so what we had in mind, not only on what you're doing today, but what you could be doing tomorrow and how to bridge that gap between today and tomorrow. Uh, as many times is the case, there were some opportunities for reinvestments. Uh, many times, again, these studies are not designed simply to say, this is where you can cut or where you can reduce costs but to identify areas where you can redirect resources that are already within your current budget or even potentially outside of your current budget to improve the overall effectiveness and efficiency of your operation. So each of those precepts or principles guided our activity as we went through this process together. Take a look at how uh, we approached it. We did divide up the major functions based on what was required in your RFP. Uh, we did assign team members to work in each of the major operational areas that you identified that you wish to include in the review. Uh, this is a summary slide of the city side as well as the public school side and how we divided each operational area to respond to your RFP. And in a few moments, Betty will be covering for you some very high level snapshot of the commendations and recommendations for me. The next slide goes into the methodology. How does Evergreen approach these type of studies? And Evergreen is going into its 17th year of serving a public sector or public organizations throughout the country. And our methodology begins typically with asking you to help us do homework. And so we asked your staff on both sides, uh, both organizations to provide reports, data sources, information that would help us learn about your organization. Uh, we conduct a diagnostic review in which the leadership on, on both sides or both organizations have the opportunity to tell us about what they feel like is working well, what could be improved, it gives us the opportunity to ask and structure questions based on that review and the first bullet of, of the documents and data that you provided to us. That helps identify or flag potential areas for findings and recommendations, but that's not all that we do. We also conduct formal virtual and on-site study interviews as well as focus groups. And so as, as part of your process there in bullet three, we visited uh, with the school side uh, as well as the city side uh, we met with staff within each of the departments that are included in your scope of work, and we gave them an opportunity to talk about how they do the work that they perform, who is assigned what type of work, or what the assignment structure would be within a staffing standpoint, what are some of the things that they're excelling at, and what are some of the things that they perceive uh, could be improved on in the future. And that serves as a basis of the more qualitative component of the analysis that we do. Then we go back and spend some time analyzing best practices, benchmarks, as well as outcomes within other organizations that have had similar challenges in those departmental or functional areas. And we prepare a draft report and then a final report uh, that summarizes the findings. We then go through a process of validating those findings and recommendations. We wanna make sure we have the details right. It's not a process to alter what we found or to alter what we've recommended, but more to make sure do we have the facts correct? You know, did we, correct, did we correctly collect the right information? Have we made appropriate assumptions based on operational realities within the organization? And also it gives us an opportunity because this occurs over a period of time, several months, to update some of the information with changes that would have occurred within your organization since we conducted the on-site interviews or the initial diagnostic. And then we reach the final report phase, which is the point that we're at working with you now, and we come back and present the results to a group like yourselves. 
we take a look at the next slide, the next slide moves us into cross-cutting issues. And many times for cross-cutting issues, there, there's quite a response. I can tell you uh, in doing this type of work, there's usually more response on cross-cutting issues than some of the individual recommendations that we make at the departmental or the functional level. So it's important to keep in mind that when we're looking at cross-cutting issues, what we're looking for are systematic themes or systematic concepts that we find across the organization that across multiple functions or sub-functions would improve overall operational efficiency and effectiveness. So we're looking for the big items. What are some of the big things that would improve the efficiency of the organization? It's important to know that it doesn't necessarily single out a single individual, a single department, a single problem or a challenge that might've occurred in the organization over time. Uh, all organizations go through those bumps in the road where they're trying to deal with things. We're looking for something that's more reoccurring and more challenging to your organization. So communication time and again came up and it does in many organizations, came up as one of the cross-cutting challenging issues that's present within the organization. Uh, these communication issues have led to a certain amount of discord between uh, the city and the schools uh, regarding the budget. That's led to some infighting, uh, some breakdown of communications. And in many ways, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can't reach agreement with Betty on something. Betty and I don't talk about it. The next time we need to talk again, we carry that baggage forward. That would occur uh, in an individual relationship between two individuals. And organizationally, this is a common occurrence as well, that once the cycle begins, it's hard to break the cycle. So we've identified several overarching, or again, cross-cutting recommendations. Uh, those will be present throughout the study in different areas to open lines of communication, encourage higher levels of information sharing, uh, as well as to seek ways for the city and schools to bridge uh, the communication funding gaps. So that in the future, there is a dialogue. It doesn't mean that everyone will agree. It doesn't mean every time that people will go away happy. Many times in government, it, it's the compromise of the scarcity that occurs, uh, but that communication is critical to ensure a strong and healthy working relationship uh, within schools as well as the city side. The next cross-cutting issue relates to technology. Uh, we're all familiar that technology is a key part of service delivery in every public organization, private organization for that matter. It is one of the greatest challenges to the city's current level of efficiency or is your level of technology resources. Uh, the lack of investment in resources, staffing, and planning uh, in technology has negatively impacted just about every department and program or function within the city. So there's a variety of challenges that you have, and you'll see these interlaced to it about the recommendations, findings and recommendations within the report. We are recommending that you hire a chief information officer, uh, that you put someone in charge of this transformation, this technological transformation that has occurred within many of your peers and many local governments nationwide, that you fill the vacancies that are present within IT. IT staff is, is very stressed and spread very thin. Uh, they wear many hats, uh, and this is not a knock on them or, or something negative about them. It's simply there's not sufficient resources to provide the level of service necessary that you're intending today, not to mention where you might go in the future. Uh, we are recommending that you conduct a citywide IT needs assessment. Time and again, across the different departments we interacted with, uh, we heard aspirations, we heard expectations in regards to if we had technology to do this, we could save money this way, or it could save time and resources this way but we don't have these technological tools or we don't have this capability because we don't have what this other community or this other municipality might have. The last piece is once you go through that process of doing that IT needs assessment in a comprehensive fashion, create an IT master plan and implement it so that you have a roadmap taking you forward into the future in the next several years, the next one to three year time horizon to undergo that transformation and modernization that's needed within the city of Norwalk. Uh, the final issue is related to facility repairs, replacements, and renovations. And we all have seen in the media, you basically can't pick up a newspaper, watch a, a news program without there being some discussion of the state of infrastructure and facilities in the public domain throughout the country and the need for not only ongoing maintenance, but also renovation or replacement in many cases. And we did find that based on your facility assessment from 2021, early 2021, the long-term investment over the next 20 years will be before, between 429 and 495 million for various repairs, replacement, and renovations on your school site or on the school facilities. Uh, you do own the school facilities within Connecticut, and there is some funding that you receive, uh, but this has not been an issue that has been addressed as proactively as other communities have addressed it within Connecticut or in other parts of the country. So we are recommending that you conduct a joint city schools assessment and prioritize the needs 
critical given this level of need and given the breadth of needs that you have on the school side that a prioritization process occur. That you go through and set priorities of what is first, what is second, what is third, uh, that you research funding options. There's a variety of alternatives available to fund the improvement of school facilities. Uh, we're recommending that you go through that process, that you not jump in without a plan, uh, without that prioritization. Go through and look at what your funding alternatives might be, and then prepare a specific plan that rolls out step by step each of those facility needs that have been identified as, as part of that previous study that was conducted uh, in the faculty, I'm sorry, in the facility assessment. I will transition I will, to Betty now. Uh, so, and um, what we are doing here is basically going through your executive summary. So if you're following along either in the PowerPoint or the executive summary, I, I really don't intend and to read every one of these items to you. I, I feel like everyone can read fairly well. And uh, what I will do is point out some of the critical issues in each area. The first section of the report, I believe it goes uh, city page one through 233. And then the second section of the report is Norwalk Public Schools and it goes MPS one through, I believe it's 195. But uh, what I am going to run through very quickly are some of the key commendations and recommendations in these areas. The, uh, the first area of the city of Norwalk uh, that I would like to address is administration and management. And uh, one of the commendable things uh, that I saw first visit to Norwalk was the Common Council Handbook that had been developed. And I really appreciated the fact that uh, that work had begun uh, already during this last uh, election and the recreation of your committees. I think there's this is a living document and that you are constantly updating uh, the charges of the various committees and, and so forth. Um, another key item that I want to point out is the restructuring of the city under the designated chiefs. Um, Evergreen found that that approach was uh, needed in order to break down silos among the various departments, and it is a work in progress. And as you read the various chapters, you're going to see that work in progress as individual departments under the chiefs and even departments under multiple chiefs are working to try to figure out the best way to work together. But the approach with the chiefs in that position, we saw as a very positive move for your organization. Um, also, one of the very first things that I noticed after spending an entire Thanksgiving weekend reading your charter uh, was a desperate need for a complete charter revision to be done. And the creation of a charter revision committee, I think, is paramount to clarifying roles and responsibilities and figuring out where you want to be in the future. Um, I also uh, want to speak about two other things. One is communications and getting the message of Norwalk out. Um, you have a communication director position, you have a customer service area. Uh, there is someone in IT called a webmaster but none of these are a, a cohesive group that addresses communication. We are recommending the investment of money in establishing a communications office that would oversee customer service and have the expertise to manage the website and provide the kind of uh, expertise that's needed by your individual uh, departments as they try to promote their own programs. Um, we found, and you're gonna see this in the schools as well, that 
uh, centralized processing and tracking for Freedom of Information Act. Right now, that's under the uh, city clerk's office. But centralizing the process and tracking it and having a, a comprehensive way to do this is needed in both organizations. Um, also, a huge need is to get rid of your paper. Every department that we looked at had rings and boxes and archives of paper. The basement is full of paper and the retrieval of those documents is, is problematic for everybody. Uh, we recommend the reinvestment of $100,000 a year over the next five years to begin digitizing all of those records. We also feel like a strategic plan for the city. You have a good start with several plans that address specific areas. But we believe that developing a comprehensive strategic plan is really important. And you're going to see this theme through every chapter as you read. You're going to see that each department needs to develop their tactical plans to go along with it. Another theme you're going to see in every department is the need to have standard operating procedures documented so that there is some protection of institutional knowledge across the entire city government. And this is also a theme within the school district. Under financial management, uh, the, there were many very positive things that we found in this area. The uh, tax collection rates were phenomenal. Uh, maintaining your bond, uh, your bond credit ratings, that was excellent. Um, and the whole P-card program and the control over the P-card program, um, which often is an area that is not well controlled, is excellently controlled by your comptroller and by the departments. Um, there are recommendations in finance that actually cross over multiple areas. So when I'm speaking of this under financial management, for example, the segregation of payroll duties are needed in order to improve internal controls. But what it means is human resources needs to take uh, responsibility for portions of that so that there are two entities responsible and there are internal controls between the two to ensure that uh, payroll is handled in that way. Um, we think that hiring an internal auditor is uh, an excellent way to continue the pro process begun with this review that an internal auditor has the ability to look objectively at individual departments and areas. Um, and we feel like this would be a good investment of your, of your money. Requiring uh, changes to the MUNA system and upgrading and making uh, good use of that MUNA system is central to the city and to the school districts. MUNIS is a shared system. It has to work for both bodies and working together uh, is critically important. Also, uh, the budget, uh, the approval process that next to the last bullet there is probably about five different recommendations. Some of them are in financial management, some of them are administration and management, but taking a critical look at the many steps and processes that um, an individual purchase has to go through, uh, all the way through the committees and the common council and so on and so forth, we believe that there's a better way. And we've made some recommendations, we've laid out some ideas, 
for doing that. And I really believe that from an efficiency standpoint and from a time standpoint, uh, these recommendations will benefit the city and the school districts. In human resources, they are understaffed. And I know that the current chief is uh, getting ready to retire or has retired and is back uh, on, on a temporary basis, but they are generally understaffed and there is a desperate need for another HR generalist in that, in that area. Uh, they, they have a lot of work on their plate for consolidating employee-related policies and procedures, uh, establishing policies for working remotely, implementing a better, more robust talent acquisition system. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in HR, and they simply cannot do it if they do not have the staff to do it with. Community services. Um, community services is an area where we found a lot of uh, great programs happening and a lot of collaboration between the city and the school districts. Uh, the health department, uh, national accreditation is phenomenal. They are doing uh, exceptional work. The early childhood coordinator being co-located with the MPS school readiness liaison is in improving communication and making sure that those early childhood programs are provided um, economically and effectively. Uh, I was very impressed with the Family Navigator program as well uh, for families and children. Um, this is an area that is also uh, under a new chief, and there are some functions and programs that need to be uh, better coordinated, uh, and we have recommended a reorganization structure. We also uh, believe that these written processes, procedures, communication channels, and so forth uh, between the leadership and the staff and also with the school districts as they're working uh, together are important. Um, we also believe that uh, reorganizing the library department functionally will help to ensure better departmental cooperation and cohesiveness. But as I said, that is a work in progress. Under public safety, um, some of the key items here, uh, there is um, a, a growing amount of overtime in both fire and police being uh, a part of the general fund monies. We understand that there were COVID dollars and so forth used to fund some of the overtime, but the use of overtime has become a standard practice. It is not specific, although there are always going to be emergency situations in fire and police where you need uh, someone to come in and work overtime. But the overtime that we saw is embedded in the standard scheduling and practices of both the fire and police, and that needs to have careful review. Um, the rest of the recommendations that are here are an effort to modernize and uh, the departments appear at this time to be uh, operating under a procedure that a smaller town might, might have in place. What we are recommending are areas where we believe they can modernize their programs and practices, use more technology to help them become uh, even better than the programs and practices that they have in place today. Under economic and community development, uh, they have reviewed their fee schedule and are recovering the cost of providing their services. Uh, they actually, uh, 
began a process. It's one of our recommendations to continue the process, but I mentioned the need to digitize and already some of the uh, funds have been appropriated for that purpose in their area. They have very unique needs because of the plans and such that they have to digitize. So they're moving forward with that. Uh, the organization and record keeping in the building and code enforcement research activities is, is helping to ensure that pa patrons are promptly receiving the requested information. But I, I want to emphasize with this that the digitizing of those records will make it even better. Uh, also, expanding the Enterprise Zone initiative, uh, we felt was a commendable thing to have happen, and that should benefit the city in many ways. Our, our recommendations, this is an area where there is crossover between public works, engineering, TMP, and so forth. These folks need to have consistent policies and standards and uh, programs so that they're not stepping on each other. I don't know how else to put it, except that they're, each of these departments has roles and responsibilities that overlap. And when they overlap and one believes that the right way to do it is this and the other believes it's something else, somebody's got to write all this down and come to some agreement on what do we want to be when we grow up. So that's one of those issues where the new chiefs are struggling to work through all of this. And it's, it's a process. So, um, one of the other areas where we felt that there was a need for some investment is the folks in TMP inherited $17 million in grant backlog. And that backlog is preventing them from being able to apply for new grants until they have used the money in the old grants. So we are recommending that they bring in at least a um, uh, one project manager, junior engineer, whatever, and attempt to clear that backlog within the next two years. And they can use contractors for some portions of this, but some grant funds have stipulations. So having this person is going to be critical for them. Plus, I believe that as they apply for new grants in the future, this person will be a valuable asset in that department. Um, the last item on the list is competi competitively bidding the parking contract prior to renewal. I understand that this contract has been in place for a very long time and that the renewals have been fairly automatic but we think that there's some benefit to competitively bidding it to see what else might be out there and if there's ways for the city to maximize revenues or reduce costs. Operations and public works. Uh, your engineering services, uh, the engineering department is providing services throughout the city to every department. Uh, the Recreation and Parks Department is doing a lot of tactical planning now under the new leadership, and these are all areas where we feel uh, it's positive for the city of Norwalk overall. The recommendation, though, is Operations and Public Works is oddly a misnomer. And we are recommending that the name of the organization be changed to operations, which then requires the renaming of the operations department that reports up to operations to be changed to public works. And in that organization structure, we believe that it will, there will be a little more clarity as to what the department is charged with doing and how they actually operate. Again, this is a work in progress um, and 
those are our recommendations for putting it together. Under information technology, the, the one thing, the, the first day I walked into the district, I met Joyce and I tell you what, this woman is customer service oriented, her staff are customer service oriented and they are absolutely 100% committed to helping everyone in the city um, with their IT needs. They have limited staff. They are a support organization, which is great. But if you want the city to move forward, as we said before, technology is the big issue. We believe that a CIO position that reports directly to the mayor is needed and that that position needs to have a hand in all aspects of the organization. You have many little systems and redundancies and Excel spreadsheets and all sorts of things that are used in every department. They're not integrated into MUNIS. They're not integrated into state reporting things, which causes more redundancies, et cetera. You need a CIO. You need to fill the vacancies in the IT area and that needs assessment and the organizational IT plan are absolutely critical to every department in the city. And it is critical to the collaboration that is needed, particularly in MUNIS, for the schools and for the city to operate more effectively and efficiently. In the IT area, and I, I want to make this so, so clear. We are recommending in the two reports somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 million in savings. We are recommending that a minimum of $12 million be reinvested in technology. And that does not include some of the technology enhancements that we are, are recommending in public safety as well. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to $15 million of those savings, we are recommending be, be put right back into IT. That's how critical we believe it is. And now we will move forward with the Norwalk Public Schools. Uh, we commend the school system for developing a comprehensive strategic plan. We are uh, pleased by the fact that the school board members are being offered professional growth opportunities and, um, and the organization structure of the executive directors is specifically related to the principals report to two executive directors and their span of control is appropriate for the uh, number of principals in schools that they support. We are recommending the elimination of the chief of staff and communications position and a restructuring of communications under the deputy superintendent. We found redundancies between what the communications uh, chief and that area were doing and what the deputy was doing. And we recommend a reorganization of their communications function under the deputy superintendent. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, Freedom of Information Act requests need to be tracked and monitored. Uh, we are recommending that the Labor Relations Legal Council position be assigned that. Uh, and in both the city and the NPS, we are recommending that um, a clerical position be added to help to monitor and track all of that information and make sure that you're in compliance with all of the Freedom of Information Act requirements. We're recommending that uh, the school district attempt to reduce the cost of legal services back 
to the 2018-19 level, there were some unusual uh, legal expenses that occurred due to an environmental study and also the rene renegotiation of labor contracts and so forth. During the pandemic, there were additional COVID items. What we're recommending is that every attempt be made to pull that back and bring legal fees back um, to the 1819 level. Again, as we discussed, administrative regulations manual, that's the same procedural manual that we talked about with the city. Um, the school district's policies are a uh, work in progress. Uh, there still are policies that go back to the 80s and 90s. And to go through every one of them is going to take some time. They have made a good start. And we are encouraging them to continue that review process. Under financial management, we were very pleased. Again, we we applaud the controls over the P-card system, as I discussed in the city. Um, the one area in financial management uh, for the schools are using position control. The city is not yet using position control, or I should say the city used to use position control, did away with that, and now you have a new budget. Uh, director, and I believe that position control is a budgetary tool that will benefit both areas. Um, and I believe that um, the, the requiring of requisitions for purchase orders is another level of control that the school districts have in place. Um, the school districts had uh, a munis assessment done by Tyler, um, and it came out in 2021 when we first arrived um, and began our study. One of the common uh, issues was that the schools needed certain functionality and the city uh, was not ready to use that functionality, et cetera. I am thrilled because when we came back for the findings meeting at the end of February, they have created a joint committee that is now researching all of the possibilities for maximizing the use of MUNIS. And it's made up of finance HR folks on both sides of the house. This is excellent. I consider this a major win and, um, and the recommendation is already well in progress. Uh, so thank you all for doing that. Um, utilizing, again, we mentioned this earlier, the facility assessment, we, we re-emphasize it here. Um, there, I don't know if all of you are aware of student activity funds, but student activity funds are like booster clubs and so on and so forth. And right now they have their own checking accounts and so forth. And what we are recommending is that they centralize all student activity funds so that it flows through the MUNA system. And that way they will have better control over those um, extraneous funds that are being collected by these other groups. Um, you may say, well, that can't be very much money. I think uh, it's very important to note that student activity funds in some cases are hundreds of thousands of dollars. So having some better controls can prevent um, abuse by uh, an, an un a parent who does not know all of the rules and regulations. School operations. Um, this was interesting and I wanna point out that under school operations, the RFP asked us to look at health services, facilities and transportation. We did not look at food service or safety and security. So, 
when I'm talking about this, I want you to understand that those were the areas of focus. And first and foremost, I am just uh, blown away by the level of collaboration and work that has gone on in, with the city health department and the schools in managing this pandemic. Uh, we have been in other districts and we have seen some failed programs and practices. This is phenomenal. Y'all are doing a great job. In the area of transportation, one of uh, the school district was uh, recognized by the National Renew Renewable Energy Laboratory for converting its buses from diesel to propane. You've renegotiated a contract that has accountability measures for the contractors. And um, a really interesting tracking system to monitor students so that they know where a student is all the time and that there is an adult to pick them up. And that is a fairly cool system, I think. In school operations is where some of this facilities maintenance business and the collaboration between the city and the school districts are really needed. There's this $400,000 limit in city ordinance for capital construction projects. Some of them are managed by the schools. Some of them are managed by uh, the city. Some of the facilities maintenance on the 25 feet are handled by the schools. So much is handled by parks, uh, recreation and parks. Um, and I understand that some work has already begun in uh, recreation and parks beginning to mow some of the school facilities and that's wonderful. But we need some documentation here as to who does what and why. Uh, we've got, uh, the, who does the fence? Who's going to take care of the snow removal? Who's going to do all of these things? We feel like documenting some of that will eliminate some of the frustration between the departments as to who's supposed to be doing what. Um, facility maintenance is break fix maintenance. Um, if you understand that terminology, as opposed to comprehensive preventative maintenance. And we are recommending that the facilities maintenance services for all of the MPS buildings be outsourced similar to the way that the city is doing it with a focus on the initial work of the contractor is to implement a comprehensive preventive maintenance program. Every report shows that preventive maintenance can say every dollar spent on preventative maintenance saves you $200 in break fix. So we really believe that this preventive maintenance is critically important for the schools. Um, this last item, the stop arm cameras, um, this is an interesting thing, and it will be in collaboration with the city if you decide to implement it. Apparently, it was tried about 10 years ago here in Norwalk, but it was rejected because it, uh, the ticketing process got bogged down in the courts. And the way this works is there's a camera, it takes a picture, that picture goes to the police department. The police department issues a, a ticket and a vendor is the one that processes and, and takes care of a lot of the paperwork on this. This can produce millions of dollars in revenues for the city and the school district. And significantly, it, it has been shown study after study to improve safety for kids on the buses uh, and prevent those drivers who feel they can pass a bus that stopped um, without any ramifications. It's a pretty cool program, truly. 
Human Resources has been working very hard. They had a study earlier last year and uh, they are implementing many things that are, are being very beneficial. They have developed a comprehensive employee handbook that contains policies and procedures. They're doing some very interesting things in tracking turnover, using uh, climate surveys and so forth, and effectively using uh, social media, radio as billboards, and a number of other approaches to try to uh, ensure that they can fill the vacancies that they need. They too are understaffed, and we are recommending hiring an additional HR generalist uh, in that department as well. And the one thing I want to caution is a lot of the ratios look at only the current employees on the payroll. I want to make sure y'all understand that HR also handles all of the retirees. And so when a retiree wants to change number of dependents, they have to go through HR in order to change the tax withholding from their retirement payments or whatever. If they want different benefits, it has to go through HR. So these folks are handling a lot more than just the current employees. Information technology is unique. Um, the technology and the integration of technology in the classrooms has, during COVID, become monumental. And it appears that MPS has done an excellent job of integrating technology into their overall programs. The parent university is pretty cool. Uh, I hope y'all will take the time to read some of the information on that parent university. <sighs> We recommend for them to work collaboratively with the city in providing technical support. And uh, we also believe that they, not unlike IT on the city side, are understaffed. Uh, at, we believe that hiring three additional full-time instructional coaches are important and that they need at least one more IT technician. Uh, we also believe they need to implement a three-year education technology plan. There was a unique area in the RFP that said Evergreen was not engaged to look at instructional issues. We are not recommending changes in curriculum, this math over that math curriculum, or anything having to do with the instructional curricular area of the district. But we were asked to look at educational operating efficiency. And we found that there were some good things going on uh, we believe that MPS is providing a consistent campus level staffing of administrators and professional support. There are X number of principals. If the enrollment is such, there's X number of assistant principals, a counselor, a psychologist, et cetera, that those allocation formulas are good. Where we found areas for improvement is that one, one issue and the communication between the city and the school districts where we felt there could be a change is to consistently report total staffing, including any staff paid through grant programs, et cetera, so that the city and MPS are all working from the same chapter and page as to how many staff are in the district. And then um, the principals did not appear to have input into the budget prior to the time that it went to Common Council for review or to the BET. And we wanted them to have a little bit more uh, input. The major recommendation 
is really the result of years of this is the way we've always done it. And uh, what Evergreen is recommending is in the area of regular education teachers, regular education paraprofessionals, um, the ratio of student to paraprofessional, student to teacher in the core regular education areas is low. And the student population is different today than it was 10, 12 years ago when this model was put into place. What we are recommending is that um, the core areas, the regular education areas be reduced and then that money be reinvested into areas where there is focused need. For example, principals told us behavioral interventionists are need are a giant need. And if you look at anything nationally, you will see that mental health in the schools is a, a primary concern. Psychologists, counselors, and so on and so forth. Also, you have a, a growing bilingual population. You need more bilingual assistance. Having a paraprofessional in the classroom, in a general education classroom to help monitor kids is great but having them in there actually able to assist in the bilingual process, to assist with special ed, to assist in those areas is more important. So what we're asking is that MPS look at the old model that's been in place in education for 10, 12, 15 years and look at the way to reallocate those resources to the critical needs, not just add them on, but reallocate. Another area where we felt there was a serious need for review is in the extra duty pay categories that are being paid out. We believe there needs to be more accountability. We believe that some of the pay categories are um, unreasonably high. Uh, in general, what we are looking at is if someone is actually doing extra duty, they should be paid for it. No question, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But there should be accountability and expectations. If you're doing this, this is what we expect. We expect this many hours of work and so forth. So by putting in place these controls, we believe that uh, significant savings can be seen. And finally, establishing a joint city working, city MPS working group to review how ESRA funds were used and uh, areas where uh, those funds may have been used to supplant ongoing operations. And this is all a part of that original communications issue. And folks, we have made it to the end and are now looking at the areas where we found that there was good collaboration going on. I've already mentioned many of these areas and I won't repeat myself. These are excellent and notable areas of collaboration. But people ask us, what about information technology? Can't we make it into one group? And our answer is no. Um, the MPS has unique needs and the city has unique needs. And there are crossover areas like Munis. But neither one of these organizations is technically capable of taking on the other's work, period. Where there are shared areas like Munis, there has to be some sort of resource sharing and collaboration plan developed between the two. In the area of human resources, you're actually operating four human resource functions in the city. 
the city and MPS operate full service human resource offices and, and that's fine and they should because each has unique needs. And then Norwalk Fire and Police operate a sort of blended HR function. Um, none of, I, we do not believe that, you know, consolidating these at this time is a good idea. What we did recommend is procuring a more robust talent acquisition system, which would be taking it from the time that a job is is open and the decision is being made as to whether or not to post through the process of hiring. And if that kind of system were in place, we believe that it may be capable of providing additional support to police and fire, but not the hiring, not the vetting, not that, but the processing through all of this that the processing could be handled perhaps in the city HR function once that uh, talent ac acquisition system was purchased. In the area of financial uh, management, uh, both, both of those functions uh, are operating effectively they're already sharing payroll processing, which is done by the comptroller and accounts payable, which is done by the comptroller. We, we asked the purchasing um, agents for both MPS and the city about the possibility of when you do a blanket purchase order, there were some blanket purchase orders that MPS was doing and the city was doing that we thought they could be consolidated. And for heaven's sakes, this whole Munis business has to be done in collaboration. Facilities management. That's an area that needs work. And I've already discussed it, Jeff discussed it. We're recommending documenting, clarifying expectations, eliminating redundancies wherever possible, and, uh, and, and just trying to figure out the best way to handle all of these facilities. And there's a host of recommendations throughout the report. Finally, here's the money. And as you see, We've used most of it up. We identified savings. We identified costs. We identified savings. We identified reinvestment opportunities. The net is over five years that there's an opportunity to save about $9 million. When you add the two savings together, you come to the 30 that I was discussing earlier on. We are recommending about 21, almost 22 million of that be reinvested in, in some way. And the net effect is $9 million. And Jeff and I thank you for the time uh, and for the opportunity to work with you. This is not the end. Uh, questions are appreciated, but I want to emphasize on that last page, this is Jeff's and my numbers to reach us at. If you have questions about specific issues and wanna get into the details. Thank you, Betty and Jeff. Um, and we also appreciate the fact that uh, this came out while the current budget was being uh, processed for next year. And we will be taking a look at some of the recommendations where we may be able to implement some of those savings in the 23-24 fiscal year. So I don't know if um, you're going to entertain questions now. Yes, I'm going to take the screen down so I can see people. So it's hard for me to see everybody with their hand raised. So if you have a question, just shout it out, I guess. Um, 
so first of all, thank you for uh, this. A lot of us got uh, copies of this today, obviously. Um, and uh, I really look forward to reading this. Looks like a, a, a sprawling and comprehensive report. I think something that obviously we've been given a lot of information, the public's been giving a lot of information. I'm wondering, at least for the city side, can you kind of drill it down to if you were to triage and say these are the three most important things the city needs to do now? If you could rank them, what would they be? Technology, technology, and technology. That's, that's exactly what I thought you were going to say. Um, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's a huge need. And um, I, I look forward to discussing it further with you, but I figured um, that way we can at least begin to think about where to start. And that seems like a, as good a place as any. I see Mr. Burnett has his hand raised. Yes, thank you, Mayor Really, um, Staying in that same thought, uh, related to te technology, uh, the recommendation was for a chief informational officer, but I did not see anything as it relates to a chief or a cybersecurity officer. And in recent day, there's been a lot of discussion across mm -hmm. the country, across the world, as it relates to concerns related to cyber attacks. Uh, what are your thoughts as it relates to a cybersecurity officer here in Norwalk? Great, Jeff. Do you want to approach that, or shall I, Betty? I, I'm I'm happy to, uh, to add a few comments and, and then uh, you to join me. So uh, the city of Norwalk, I believe, and identified in some of its previous budget analysis, adding a position to serve it in that capacity. And I believe it, it was budgeted for, if I remember correctly, in a previous budget. I do not believe it was hired. Uh, I don't believe there's ever been anyone in that position. And so we did indicate that based on that being one of the vacancies that you've identified as an organization that you fill that position. We concur. It's absolutely critical. Uh, what, what's going on more recently or what we've seen more re recently reiterates that. But, but there's a, a number of local governments uh, in the last several years that have dealt with ransomware. They've dealt with having to pay in some cases to have access back to their own data. And so it, it's absolutely critical that you fill that position and, and have those expertise on your staff. Yeah, and I will add that if you go to recommendation 9-2 in the city report, pages 268 through 270, speaks to filling the senior applications manager and chief information security officer positions. An excellent point. Okay, looking to see if any other hands are raised. I don't see any right now, but- uh, uh, Ms. Diana, Carpio, my hands up. I, I see Ms. Carpio. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for this robust presentation. And like Josh said, we just got the book with all the information and there's a lot to go over and read and highlight and um, you know think about things uh, in a different level. And then I would like to ask if it at all possible, would you guys be able to return for a specific joint meeting on just you know everything that um, we'll all have questions on because it's a lot of information to take in in a short period of time because I literally just got it like three hours before the meeting and there's more detailed here. But I do want you to also clarify, I know that um, it was a discussion and I know that Jen will um, also want to know this question. Uh -huh. I know that you discussed about putting the finances of booster clubs and um, any type of school clubs together. Um, any club that's a 501c already that does not use the NPS um, number or 501C does not have to no. put in the yes. funds. Yes, it's That's only those separate. organizations that are using the umbrella 501C3 uh, that should be controlled because they're using your name they're using your status as a nonprofit. And if there is bad behavior of any kind, it's at your, it, it's under your umbrella. And so it's those that do not have an independent 501c3 that we're recommending. 
Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other hands or any other questions? Uh, Ms. Revoluse. Um, again, I just wanna uh, repeat, thank you for doing this. Um, would love to be able to address you guys again once we go through this again, stating that we just received these packages. I just wanted to ask you a question in particularly because under Lamont's status or Lamont's um, chiefing, uh, there was some, uh, everything was spoken of, but I just wanted to see how do you feel like our libraries are doing in Norwalk? Like, how do you feel our, um, our local libraries are doing? in a little bit more in depth. You don't have to go crazy. I would love to talk to you about a lot more <laughs> things, but I'm just wondering how, how, do you, how do you see that? How do you feel about well, that? Well, first of all, I, I was impressed by the fact that you have two big libraries and that the libraries are available and are working in collaboration in many cases with the school districts on various programs and such. I think there's more that can be done there. Uh, part of the issue that we saw is that the two libraries and some of the departments within the library operation are operating. Um, it, it, you remember we talked about, or I talked about the silos and how the chiefs were breaking down the silos. I think some silo breaking down needs to happen in the library organizations and, and uh, reorganizing them functionally to try to bring them into a cohesive, you know, one unit, even though there's two locations, multiple departments within those locations, bringing them into a cohesive unit, I think it's going to be a challenge over the next couple of months, years. Um, I would say that those silos maybe sit apart amongst a lot of all of this, right? So I appreciate that input. I do. Um, again, I do thank you. I just wanted to personally know how that looks because there's been a lot of push in trying to make them more of a centralized place for Norwalk so we can get people back in um, working and utilizing them. And, you know, Sherelle has done a great work in trying to uh, make that happen. But uh, there's so much here in, on both sides, on NPS and on the city, that I'm just so happy to hear and see a lot of it. I was kind of like, yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and, well, and, um, to, to answer your question and to answer the prior question, we are available here as you need us. I am most willing to talk to you individually, collectively, or however you need me to be. I am here for you. Okay. Um, I don't want this to be a doorstop. Uh, it's a big book and it will make a good doorstop, but I would prefer that it was used for some other purpose. So uh, anything I can do to help you understand the issues, whatever. The, the other thing about the report, I think um, maybe we haven't emphasized enough. It, it tells a story. And for anyone that is, has been wondering what goes on in this department, how does this work, et cetera. I, I think just reading the report will give you an idea of the story of how this whole big organization works and how the pieces fit together. So thank you happy so much reading. For your work. Yes, <laughs> and thank you so much. I'm definitely doing it. Thank you so much for the time. I don't see any other hands raised at this point. Uh, Mr. Kaitis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell, uh, did you, in your, in your, in your travels, have you ever found that interviewing city employees with um, uh, anonymously gives you a better end result? Cause I have heard, and it's been a concern of mine that without anonymity, some city employees may be hesitant to be forthcoming with their responses uh, due to you know, the fear of repercussions. I mean, how did, did you have that in mind with when you interviewed city employees, either it be on the city side or board of education? Um, it's always a concern. When we do any of these reviews, it's always a concern. But I hope that as you read the master report, you will see that no names are used and that um, 
just because one person told us something, that is not a finding. Uh, we triangulate everything that we do and we spend hours and hours and hours proving or disproving that what we were told was true, false, or in the middle. Uh, so we are not going to say, the lady in the blue dress told me this. You know, what we're going to say is that we were told this, we reviewed this, we found this. And so when hopefully when you read this, you will see that no individual is hung out to dry because they told us something. We actually found the proof of it. Okay, so I guess the follow-up question to that is maybe give some of these employees who had the, I guess, the stones to, to be forthcoming and, and transparent with you. Uh, will their names be released or in any or given to anyone in, I see you nodding your head, so that's that's good. All right, great. Thank you. Ms. Carpio, are you raising your hand again? Um, I just actually got a text from the public. A member of the public wanted to know if the uh, presentation was going to be on your website. I guess they can't find it. This, the slides that she just sent, showed. Yeah, I, I think we can probably arrange that. This is Leisha, just to let you guys know, a page has been created on our website with the efficiency study on it. The, um, Michelle, are you on? I believe that the link is going to be norwalkct.org slash efficiency study. Um, but we've given that to the press in the press release. So mm -hmm. people should be able to find it either later today or tomorrow. And the PowerPoint you, is a reiteration of the executive summary. So the executive summary is in the report. And I, I think you'll find that it pretty much follows the PowerPoint. And we'll post it in the BOE website as well. Yeah. Mr. Hovelman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Evergreen, um, uh, Ms. Russell, Mr. Lang. Th this was... This is fantastic, and I'm 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 going to start digesting this full report uh, as soon as I possibly can. I have a question when we get into the charter area, the charter ordinances and procedures. And I know you and I uh, we we did speak about this on the phone, um, and you've identified some things in here that are you know some some uh, you know things that are in our charter that, that can possibly, uh, you know, streamline it, update it, those types of things. Are there other areas that you see that fiscally within the charter that are, that we should immediately address a, a sort of list of priorities within the charter? Because our charter revision process is, is fairly cumbersome and has to go through a referendum. And so, you know, I'd love to know if there are more, there's more specificity about what you see that could be updated within the charter that would also uh, have an economic impact to the city? I did not uh, specifically look to the charter for financial um, ramifications. It's a great question. What I was looking for was who does what where. And I, I, I mean, it was all over the place. And um, that in and of itself, if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, or it's not clear what I'm supposed to do, that that breeds this whole business of, well, we do it this way, and we do it this way, and this department does this, and this department does that. You know, the, the charter should be a very simple, straightforward, you know, thing. And the recommendation that I had from many of you that I spoke with was, well, let's fix this. No, let's fix that. I don't agree. I am saying a comprehensive rewrite of the charter with all of these things, all of these pieces put in order in a concise and meaningful way. And um, yes, the voters need to have the ability to say no to this. I don't want this piece. But 
if you don't rewrite the whole thing and, and put it into a comprehensive, meaningful document, it's going to continue to be this piecemeal thing that requires revision on a regular basis. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that because I, I, I felt that way and I, I, want, I, I wanted to hear that because I, I, I agree with you. I think we're working with a document that was written in 1925 and it's 2021 yes. and, and I think that it, it needs to be looked at through that lens and I appreciate the work that you guys have put in on this and I appreciate everything that you've done and uh, I hope uh, we can continue this relationship and move it forward. Thank you. I have two hands raised, but I, I've been remiss. I wanted to know if uh, Dr. Estrella wished to say anything at this time. I apologize for not acknowledging that earlier. No, I'm good, Mayor. Okay. I, I just want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask their questions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Livingston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and just before I ask my question, I just want to uh, point out what, or comment on what uh, Mr. Huberman just said and what a lot of members of the, uh, the council already know is that at our first meeting in April, we hope to have a presentation on a proposed plan forward in terms of uh, revising our charter. So that that is, I know better. Than, yes, I know you'd like that. <laughs> yeah. so we, we we hope to have a presentation at that meeting about how how we do move forward. But anyway, uh, my I was going to. Recently asked, and first off, I really appreciate your presentation and look forward to reading all this. I'm sure I'll have a lot more questions like others will afterwards. But one thing you said that, that made me wonder um, about uh, whether or not you had um, considered salaries when you did this. And the reason I asked that is because when we talk about the IT area particularly, we know that it's always difficult to get people to be able to afford them. And I was wondering when you were putting together your numbers and your recommendations, whether you looked at things like that. Um, in trying to recommend the hiring, we went to the bargaining agreements and used the salary data that was available there. And so when we tried to place a position, we considered where it was in the current bargaining agreement. Um, as far as doing a salary study, no, we did not. Uh, but um, part of the NPS salary study that was done last year did look at salaries. And in the NPS arena, they felt that they were extremely competitive. Um, we did not do that on the city side. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Revolu? Okay. Um, again, I love I love all this. I just have two questions. Um, I love the strategic plan. I love all that. But when you say this may be my naivete, minimi minimizing legal cost, where how does that exactly look like? Because just maybe again being and because we have lawyers on here, that's why I'm even asking this. Mm -hmm. um, my thoughts of thinking about, you know, when you're using your lawyer, when you're putting retainers down, how do we bring our costs down with lawyers? Well, I think um, a step has already been taken by MPS in hiring mm -hmm. Barbara Nemani as the legal counsel labor relations person. And I do think that she can provide uh, a level of legal service um, that you've already, you've had to contract for in the past. And I understand that you had a legal counsel, mm. uh, uh, an, an employed legal counsel at one point in time. Um, and that sort of went away over for whatever reason. And I think that in and of itself will do it. But I also think that managing it and um, uh, the superintendent is now uh, controlling who calls the attorneys and when they call and so on and so forth. And I believe that in that process, it's going to automatically happen. I think that between those two things, there's a good chance that this is going to happen. And as long as everybody is aware that this is what the goal is, I, I really think this is going to happen naturally 
uh, just by virtue of those two things. One, having the superintendent review what goes to legal counsel and directing those things that can and should be directed to Barbara uh, in that way. Does and that my, help? Oh, yes, but, that definitely helped. That helped a lot. What were you going to I'm sorry, but that helped a lot. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. So, Betty, just if I may add, and, and I think the one of the challenges we had, one, we didn't have a, a legal counsel on staff. Um, for a while, but I think the second thing is the cycle of co um, collective bargaining agreements. Yes. And we had uh, that particular year, almost every single contract due for renegotiation. And that comes with an associated cost. So part of the spike in um, legal costs is also associated with having to engage in collective bargaining negotiations for um, I think of almost every single uh, bargaining unit within MPS. And Lisha uh, and uh, Ray, Bernie and I had a discussion about this because Ray has been doing a lot of this for you and uh, on the city side. And depending on who you find and, and the uh, position as it is filled, that could change the dynamic on the city side. The city has not had to hire outside counsel for the negotiation process. Gotcha. And once Ray is gone, I don't know, you know. So this gotcha. is an issue that's emerging. And, you know, the concern is, what will you do? And, right. and so knowing that that bridge is out there and that there may be a need in the future, the same challenge may be uh, to the city as well during the negotiation process. It would be nice if y'all had all the same bargaining agreements. Then you can only just do one bargaining agreement. But mm. no, y'all have to have all these <laughs> <laughs> and my last, which is, again, this is really good to, I'm really going to have fun with this book. Um, I personally just want to also hear a little bit more about this, the centralizing of the process and tracking of the Freedom of Information Act um, requests. I think that's, that's actually very important. It is. Um, and um, just, I don't know, maybe even for our community and maybe expressing or extenuating an idea of how we do that because that that's that's extremely important and that's a big part of transparency that I think we really need to on put both in mind. sides on both sides of the on house. On both sides, yeah. People have been free to go to this department or that department and say, "I want, I want, I want," and and uh, from a customer service standpoint, their the departments are responding but there's no tracking and there are requirements in the law that say X has to happen here, has to happen here, has to happen mm -hmm. here. So I think the Freedom of Information Act is being complied with, but I could not find the evidence of that because right. city, city clerk tracks those that come through the website, oh, but, right. but the departments don't know that they're supposed to refer everything there. So it's a, a matter of educating the whole organization structure that there is a process and that it needs to go this way or this way. Am I making some sense? And so now you have a centralized process for doing this. It can be tracked and you can document the fact whether well, I, there was no question in my mind that there was um, inherent compliance happening, mm -hmm. but the documentation wasn't there to, support to prove it. it. Mm -hmm. And so by implementing a more centrally controlled process, we felt that that would ensure compliance, ensure control, and ensure that the community is getting what they should, when they should, according to the law. And lastly, thank you for just discussing languages. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> the need for um, truly intentional with our, with our um, growing um, English language speakers 
there's 64 or 62 different languages in this um, town that I just feel we need to use our um, use our tools to truly be equitable in any and every language that's not of English speaking, um, even though I represent Haitian Creole. Thank you very much for all your answers. Any other questions, Sue, before we move on. I don't see anybody's <laughs> hand. Oh, Ms. Oh. Uh, Ms. Uh, Johnson. I'm, I'm going back and forth between the two screens. So Ms. Oh, Johnson. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to echo uh, Ms. Russell. This is phenomenal uh, work. And I know I enjoyed my conversation with you and the ongoing kind of deep dive we're all going to do into this, this book. And uh, it's up to us to make sure it doesn't become a doorstop. That would just make, I think, so many of us uh, it would be really? an expensive doorstop. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, but also this is too good for it to be that. So thank you. Um, and real quick, I'm thinking about, um, we talked a lot about, uh, and I'll pick up the thread that my colleague just dropped about language, justice, and equity. And in terms of broader, do you think that these recommendations will help our city government and uh, schools as well uh, become more equitable for more of our city members? Like there, there will be, returns on this investment for a, a broad representation of, of all of these Norwalkers who call the city home? You know, when we came into the city, I had the feel of a small town. I, I felt Norwalk was a community where I could live. It was a small town. It was joyful and collaborative, et cetera. And the more I got into city government, I realized that you may still be operating as a small town, but you are not a small town. And in terms of equity and in terms of services to the community, these reinvestments are really, really important because it is through that, that you can open up the services and, and make them available to more people. When I say technology, 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 I really mean it because it's, it's the equalizer. It's the way, you know, if I don't know the rules to the game, I'm new to this country or I'm new to this area and I don't know the rules to the game and I have to try to navigate a very complex system, it's, it, it is inherently inequitable. But putting it out there and providing it to everybody in a clear, you know, easily accessible way does bring equity to the program. Okay, I, any other hands? I'm going back and forth between screens so I can see. Uh, if you can raise your hand on your screen, uh, I mean, on the button down below, that'd be helpful. Uh, I don't see, uh, Ms. Johnson, you- I just had a follow-up if that's all right, Mayor. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And thank you for that, uh, Ms. Russell. I really take that, you know, what you said um, is like a thesis in many ways to what you're, you're giving us. A less, like more of a nuanced question. You're talking about a documenting standardized operating procedures. Do you think that it would be helpful too if uh, down the org chart, uh, reference documents were created by city and, and even MPS workers? I'm saying, okay, I see the nodding. Absolutely. <laughs> that is a universal issue and documentation. It's not the way we've always done it. It's the way once you start writing the documentation of what you're doing, that's when you can see the pain points and the issues. And that's when you can make meaningful improvement. Ms. Najilski Eichner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll add to everyone else's thanks. This is um, an extraordinary accomplishment. I have so many thoughts um, uh, and many things I need to read more and, and more in depth. But one particular thing I, I wanted to follow up on. So you outlined the, I think, rather stunning um, and extraordinary capital needs for our school system in the coming 20 years. Um, I did not see a comparable number for our city facilities. Do you have that number? Did I miss it um, in the- okay. No, we, the, the 
to our knowledge, there had not been a comprehensive assessment like that for the, but obviously there are needs on both sides of the house. And so having this uh, collaborative working group that is looking at it, you can lay out those needs. And if the city needs an assessment like that, in order to lay all of the prioritized needs out, then I would certainly recommend that. Um, but it was the document we had at hand that was stunning. And, and the more we asked questions, well, we can't do it. We just, there's nothing we can do. We don't have the money. That's all there is to it. Well, let's stop on the money side and let's start on the, what's the real need? And then let's try to figure out how to find the money to do what absolutely has to be done. When I looked at it, there were some pie in the sky things that I'm pretty sure are 20 years out. I, I you know, I take those off the plate. Now let's talk about the fuel tanks that are gonna explode tomorrow you know, or, or the things that need taking care of right now. And I, I will assume that the, the whole public works area operations, which we're now recommending it be called, could probably add to that list an enormous amount, but it has to be laid out there on the table. Ignoring it is not an option. And that's the issue is right now saying, oh, we don't have the money for it, so we just can't do it. We've got to lay it out. And you've got to tell the citizens of Norwalk, you know, folks, yes, it's gonna cost money, but we have to do it. Ms. Young? And just to follow up on that briefly, because this is, I think, a, a messaging point. Could you clarify, you know, give any sense? I mean, these are not problems that are new problems, right? Could you have any sense of how long this is sort of accumulated over? Because I think that might help people understand. 20 to 30 years of accumulated stuff that has to be addressed. And yes, you're here today and you're the ones catching the brunt of it. But it didn't happen overnight and it can't be fixed overnight. Mm -hmm. But you can't ignore it because it will only get bigger. Thank you. Ms. Young. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I'll just repeat what everybody else has been saying. I'd like to thank you, Ms. Russell and Mr. Ling for this um, work that you've done for us. Um, this is definitely gonna be another roadmap for us to work from. What I, my, my question, is, and I found it very interesting. I think, I'm not sure if it was you or Mr. Ling who presented it, but you talked about each department having a strategic plan. And then and then it just made me kind of think, then what, how do you see that those plans differing from our POCD, our plan of conservation and development that we also use as a roadmap in each department to kind of, you know, um, work towards those goals that, the residents, the community has said that they want to see the city go in. Mm -hmm. So if you if you have some and thoughts on that. That plan is an excellent starting point. And when we talk about strategic planning, that plan addresses certain aspects of the city's operation, not all aspects of the city's operation. Uh, you know, <laughs> So when we talk about strategic planning in the department level, we're generally using the term tactical plan that is linked to the strategic plan. So at the department level, they are tactically trying to figure out how they are going to achieve the goals that are in the master plan. So some of the goals that are in that plan today are ones that you're going to want to keep. I mean, those are the things the citizens want. But you also have to look at and how are we going to handle this technology issue, which is cross-cutting. 
You know, how are we going to handle the recruitment and hiring of adequate staff in all of these areas? So, you know, a tactical plan at the department level is pushing up. Um, Jeff, help me out here. It, it's a it's building on it. And it says, this is what you want. And this is how I'm going to help you get there. And each of those tactical plans in the department create the pillar that holds up the big plan in the sky. Does that, Jeff, help me? Betty, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so our assumption would be, and, and, and not just in Norwalk, but in most organizations, you're going to have a variety of plans that govern uh, everything from the level of workforce engagement you'd have with your own employees. You might have community engagement plan. You might have specific programs that have plan elements in them. And that tactical plan, as Betty mentioned, needs to align up and down. So it's the middle. It, it's the glue, in essence. Uh, one way to think about it, which is mentioning the pillars. So if you want to think of the, of the pillar analogy versus the glue, um, the roof would be the strategic plan. Where is the city going as a whole? What is the city hoping uh, to accomplish at a high level? What are the objectives as an organization uh, that it's implementing to meet its mission uh, from a municipal standpoint? Tactical plans as the pillars really are the individual departments and their alignment with and their actions to align with the overall strategic plan. Then below that would be these other plans. I think the plan you're referring to, they need to tie in downward as well, where, where those components actually work into that plan because ideally you would have full alignment from the actions of the individuals or the individual employees or those programmatic offerings that you have up through those tactical plans and into the overall strategic plan. So a common element to give an example in, in many communities uh, would be something along the lines of, of having uh, an integrated or uh, an aligned community. Uh, so a community that, in essence, we're working toward the same goals, that, that we have that alignment, we have communication, we have cooperation, collaboration that occurs in our community. So there'd be actions, individual departments that would, would be taking that are programmatic in nature. They would be actions taken by the department at the department leadership level. And then that would tie into the overall city's efforts. So each of those small pieces reinforcing that, that overall uh, ceiling. And so... That's what we recommended that, that, in essence, that alignment take place. And then ideally, that would tie into your budgetary process. That would tie into your decision making about resources. That would tie into your prioritization. That you'd be able to say, well, we can't do this this year, but where is it versus these other items that support the roof, again, support the strategic plan, but in essence, might be almost competing across departments, which is the more aligned with, with what you want to accomplish. So that, that's what we had in mind with integrating those, those three levels together. Great, thank you. Ms. Young, your, your hand is still up. I'm... Yeah, and I just had one more question. And I know my uh, uh, Councilwoman Revoluce uh, asked this question earlier. And so I, I guess I just wanted to follow up with it. I know that, um, and, and it's the libraries and I know, um, are, are, what are some of the, 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 the positives? Are there any things that they're, that's going on that we can speak to that's going in a very innovative direction um, within our library system. And, and I should, second, I, I should know the answer to this question, but you know, we have another independent library system, the East Norwalk Library. Um, it, it, was there any, did we look into that? I mean, I'm sure by some sort of well, charter what, or- Right, what, one of the issues with the library, um, that we saw, and I think in order to build, I, I, first of all, the libraries are doing a lot of really neat things. And those are, uh, there's a lot of areas of collaboration and a lot of great things going on. But they've got boards and commissions and a chief and this and this. And how do all of those work together? And we recommended looking at all of that ordinance stuff. I mean, the library was a prime example of uh, a lot of chiefs. <laughs> and, you know, a, a library director that's stuck in the middle trying to juggle what this group wants, what that group wants, what this group wants. And, 
um, there has to be some clarification of who does what where. And again, um, bringing all those boards and commissions and, and leaders and whatever together so that there is some efficiency and effectiveness in the organization structure itself. And I, I we've described it in the report. I don't know that I need to go into a lot of yeah. detail on in here, but there's too many chiefs. And, and, and there's an the, Indian that's stuck in the middle. Stuck in the middle. What about the East Norwalk Library? I'm just, I, I know that it's it's separate from the city, but did you look into that or, or how they function at all? We we focused on the two primary okay. city okay. libraries. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Goldstein? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I just wanted to clarify uh, just on the MPS side, I, I, give me a sense of sort of where you think, um, if anything, what the report said about um, hiring additional teachers or whether this, if, whether that's necessary. Can you just sort of clarify your recommendations in that area? The clarification is that the history in education in general, this is not really unique to MPS, but uh, it is more a historic kind of thing. Hiring a regular education teacher, a third grade teacher. I, I, I want to hire a third grade teacher and I'm going to give that third grade teacher a paraprofessional in there because the class size is this or that, you know, so on and so forth. Education is moving away from that and primarily because the public school systems in the nation are becoming more and more diverse with more and more special needs. Uh, special education is a growing area of need. Uh, bilingual education, I think someone mentioned it. It's not just English to Spanish. It is English to a gazillion different languages. Uh, I think I heard 60 different languages. And um, 64. A, okay. A paraprofessional in the classroom to, all right, I'm going to be crude, to blow somebody's nose or to help them go to the bathroom. That's, that's great. But what the world needs now in the current situation is more targeted, focused help. And those kids uh, where, when I was growing up, there was one teacher in the classroom and there were 20 something of us in, uh, sitting at our little desks. That's not the world today because half the kids sitting at that desk have a special need of some sort. So what we're recommending is that you break down the old model and you develop a new model that doesn't just put general education in, but provides focused attention. Yes, you still need the third grade teacher, but when you're putting supplements into that classroom to help, they have to be targeted. They have to be addressing the needs of the kids that are there, not the kids that were there in 1980 and 90. I'm sorry. Do you that mean- That was my for the night. It's revolution. Sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm Can sorry. I piggyback on that question that Josh said? Go ahead, uh, Ms. Carpio. So, um, you mean staff with extra certificates or extra specialties for the children I'm not in a position, and Evergreen was cautioned against getting into specifics in terms of instruction and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what I am saying at this level is that the model of staffing that was there in the past needs to be rethought, and it's up to you guys to say what the instructional needs are of your kids. I guess just to clarify the focus of my question and forgive me, cause I don't think it was very well asked. Um, wasn't really about the instruction and curriculum cause like, um, but it was more on sort of whether your recommendations of whether there's sort of a net increase in staff and whether there needs to be one. 
um, in your in your assessment. That's not taking it. And, you know, and what we're what we're recommending is don't add more. Reallocate what you have to this. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I just want to applaud. I'm sorry. I just want to applaud what you just said because I literally believe that oh, there's so much that's antiquated that just needs to be reassessed. I also came out of a meeting with three paralegals today um, for a student that I'm working with right out of the high school and had a meet with them as well. So everything you're saying was literally addressed today and I appreciate those words. My last question to you, um, I'm a little bit of like that Will Smith and iRobot type of thing, right? So like when we go into like, um, making everything digital. I understand it's neat, but it's also kind of why I was asking about the library. Um, there's several points, but it's more archiving all of this in a way in space where it's accessible and doesn't disappear somewhere, right? I think my brain always go like, yeah, we should make it all digital, but how do we make it that it's not archived, disappear, and un un Okay, the digitizing of so records how is in not your at, at the library level. No, I know, I know, but it, it's I get it. It's just where my brain was going with all of it. And I think about, literally, when I go back to thinking about this, I come from a medical background. So I, re I remember when we went to all of our, all of our files going digital, right? So I just, there was, there's an amount of time in which a file is going to come in or get discarded or get archived over. In your, prof um, in your profession in dealing with this, how um, streamlined and strategic is it when everything becomes digital? I know it's important because it's so hard to go through a, a attic full of paper, I get it, but that paper is physically and it's there. When it's digital, it just becomes digital zeros and ones. So I just wanna make sure like how do we, um, um, secure our information once gone digital, if that makes sense. The security of the information, it, this, is, this has been an emerging uh, industry over the last 15 years or so. But I would urge you um, to take a tour of zoning and code enforcement and watch them play with the paper. Mm. It's a mm. mess. And um, the state library, the Connecticut State Library, had many conversations with them. I, I talked to the city clerk and all of the archive stuff that's everywhere. There's rules, there's regulations, and there's certain uh, ways that the state library says, yes, digital records can replace paper and certain areas where you have to keep the paper, but you can retrieve right. it digitally. Right, so right, right. the efficiency comes in when the coding enforce uh, the the zoning and code enforcement. I'm sorry, it's okay. I'm getting tired of my tongue. It's twisted. It's okay. I'll but, say motion in a but second. But <laughs> when they have to contact um, Irene and she has to send somebody down to the basement and they have to bring up 20 boxes and somebody has to physically go through 20 boxes yeah, and then it. they have to do this and then they have to make copies of those box you know whatever is in those boxes trust me there are major major efficiencies, efficiencies to be had okay. from from not moving giant boxes around let let Irene take you on a little tour of the basement and then yeah. it will all come. <laughs> I could imagine. I could just I could just imagine because I could see the need of it. I just again with the little back of like the securing of it. it but I, I, I could of course it just doesn't make sense to be in a pile of boxes that just literally the time to walk it is inefficient when I could just literally put a search engine and type it up. I get that completely. Just securing would it, you, if that makes how sense. How would you like it if the town clerk lost your marriage license? You know, just right. right. <laughs> there's right. critical documents that are sitting there it. in paper that have to be taken care of. Just I get have it. to be. I get it. Thank you so much. I get. I really do appreciate both of your work, Jeff and um, Betty. I really do. This is amazing. Thank you. All right. Are there any further questions, Mr. Adzima? Hi. Good evening. 
Betty, great to hear you again. Uh, yes. One just general question I had um, regarding uh, consumer input. You know, when uh, being able to couple uh, how efficient we are, uh, is there any reason that consumer input wasn't included? You know, i.e., whether it be folks from the city side or just user parents? Uh, time and RFP. Um, it was not in the contract document, so we did not do stakeholder involvement in, and try to do surveys and pull in stakeholder information. Um, it's a different kind of study, and mm -hmm. it would have been um, a different focus. Uh, mm -hmm. We would have probably ended up with a similar kind of document, but um, to get from October 21 to March 22 with a document that I believe is amazingly comprehensive. I want to applaud my team. I really want to applaud my team. Jeff and I are the face, but let me tell you, we had a phenomenal group of consultants behind us and they are so sick and tired of me sending out emails or making phone calls and demanding that yesterday they need to get this. Uh, I have to have it, you know, by five o'clock tomorrow or else, you know, we, we made our due dates. We made our due dates. And I'm proud of that. But um, there, there are many things we could have, would have, should have. But there just wasn't time. You said you entertained that question and the roadmap you left us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Revolu, is your hand up again or did you forget to take it down? <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Oh, Ms. Uh, Brown, uh, you're on mute. I just wanted to commend you and your group on producing this report. It is very informative. It's very clear. And um, I really appreciate the fact that you've been able to illustrate some of the challenges um, that we face and some of the work that we need to do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And now the work really begins because I turn it over to you. And um, I had talked to Mr. Livingston about this and I've, I've talked to several of you about what it's gonna take from here. And I really think <clears throat> each of you, I'm losing my voice. Um, I think each of you um, now need to take ownership and begin the implementation process. And if there's anything that I can do, that Jeff can do to help you through that, you just need to let us know. We're here for you. Okay, um, anybody else? Going once, <laughs> going twice, <laughs> gone. <laughs> okay, well, thank you everybody. And uh, thank you for, this time, uh, I think it was really interesting. Uh, as you look at the report, I'm sure uh, you will find like I did that uh, there's a tremendous uh, amount of information in there, a wealth of information. Uh, actually, uh, I find it very interesting reading and I think that you've done a superb job on identifying uh, how the city operates and how we can operate more effectively and more efficiently. So we've got a long road ahead of us and we wanna make sure that these uh, uh, recommendations, these uh, they, they don't become the doorstops. They don't get put on a shelf just to gather dust. We're gonna put together um, working groups to make sure that we find uh, the low hanging fruit and then try to find out what we can do uh, in the long term. So again, thank you. Uh, I think now um, I'm going to need a motion. Motion to adjourn? Nope, nope, not yet. Oh. <laughs> A motion to go into a motion. Oh, to right. We have an executive session. session. I forgot about that. So I'm I need so a motion sorry. from the council. Motion for executive into, session. Okay. Ms. Revolus votes to go into mm -hmm. executive session. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will come back to uh, this public session after executive session. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Good evening. Yeah, Irene. 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 Yes. It's Mario. Could you please forward me the invite for the executive session? I don't have it. Okay. Let me look for it and I'll send it to you. Um, Otherwise, uh, yeah, Darlene, are you on too? No, I'll send it. I'll, I'll look for it right now. Yeah, whoever has it, send it to me. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. The executive session. Hold on, Mario, I'm looking for it. Uh, Irene, do you want me to send a link to anyone? Oh yeah, do you have it? Um, yeah, I'm going through my email. Yes, yeah, did Jeff, you send it to Mario? You send it to yeah, Mario. send it to Mario. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Jeff. No problem. I was looking for the link, but Jeff's sending it to me. Jeff, I'm I'm gonna I sign think. off. Can you t just tell me, uh, text me or email me what time the the actual meeting ends? Sure, no problem. Thank you, Jeff. Have a nice evening. You too. Bye. Bye.
get the instant weather at that moment at that very airport that we needed right now.
nauseous. You guys are all fast. That's impressive. You're tired. <laughs> After two years, we're all becoming adept at Zoom. Mm -hmm. oh. It took me the full two years. <laughs> now imagine being in person, having to deal with this till 11. Just Mr. remember, Mayor, we're going back, back to person. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, are we back on the record and ready to go forward? Not yet. Not yet. We have to stream live, so we have to go live. I think we are on live. Right? Uh, live, live. There you go. Okay, now we're live. Okay, we are back in public session. It is 11 p.m. during executive session. No motions were made and no votes were taken. Do I have any motions on the floor? Mr. Goldstein. I'd like to make a motion uh, with the following language. Um, uh, to and and to quote authorize Alan Lowe, the city's building and facilities manager, in coordination with the city's law department, to negotiate a purchase price for the parcel sites identified and set forth in the legal memorandum, file number WD five zero four zero 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 one five three, issued by Assistant Corporation Counsel Darren L. Callahan, dated March eighteenth, twenty twenty two. Uh, parentheses, the memorandum in quotes, uh, parentheses, uh, acquisition for school purposes per negotiation parameter set forth in said memorandum. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Uh, Goldstein made the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Now, Ms. Revoluz? Motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor? Uh, opposed? Abstentions? We are now adjourned at 11.01. Thank you all. Thank you.